so he's recording this. All right. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we did not make it easy for you to find this talk. So uh, those of you who've made, arrived here, congratulations. This is uh, uh, beyond, above and beyond the call of duty to come to a, a, a talk like this. Since we were going to be over in Hearst Mining and only found out today that we had to go somewhere else instead. Uh, so my name is Henry Chesbro, and I've been one of the hosts of the Open Innovation Speaker Series. So it seemed only fair that uh, I take my turn in the barrel and uh, talk a little bit about some of the work I'm up to uh, here at Berkeley. Uh, and I think you'll see directly uh, some of the connections to the themes in the Open Innovation Speaker Series. And in fact, I'm going to do two things uh, in my talk with you this, this afternoon. First, I'm actually going to briefly recap just a bit of the Open Innovation framework to give you a perspective uh, on what I'm going to spend most of my time on this afternoon, which is the second thing, which is uh, industry-university research collaborations. Um, and uh, I want to use the open innovation uh, framework to develop a perspective on this so that we look at it uh, from both the side of the industry as well as the university in these collaborations. So we're going to look at hopefully both sides uh, of it. And then uh, the principal discussion will be about a, a case study I've recently completed uh, with the help of one of my students uh, on the Energy Biosciences Institute, uh, which has actually been set up here at Berkeley uh, over in uh, Melvin uh, Laboratory next to Haas. Uh, and so that's uh, up and running, and that'll be, that's actually going to be the uh, uh, perspective, the, the meat that I'm going to talk about and how this is in some sense an experiment uh, and evaluate that experiment both from the perspective of a public research university and the goals of a public research university on the one hand and the things that it must do to preserve academic freedom, to maintain the values and ideals of the university, uh, promote academic inquiry and broad dissemination of results. And those goals uh, have to coincide with the goals of an industry partner who in this case, as you'll see, is investing sizable resources, uh, not just for charity and philanthropic purposes, but because they actually have some specific strategic objectives they're trying to accomplish. And so the things that they want to do to get a return on that investment uh, may well be in tension with the goals of a public university. And so I hope that we'll have, I'll present some stuff uh, to you on both sides of that and uh, very much welcome your thoughts and reactions to this. And we're going to be a small group, so we've got time for lots of discussion as well. I think we have to be out of here at 5.30. So with that, I'm going to get started. But if you have comments or questions as we go along, please uh, ask as we go forward. OK, so I want to begin uh, to motivate this uh, to look back in history a little bit and say, if you were uh, an entrepreneur or a, a young company with uh, good sales and profits 50 or 100 years ago, where would you look for useful ideas that could help you grow your business and sustain uh, your business? Because you know that if you don't make investments over time, you'll eventually, your competitors will catch up and you will be dragged down to become a commodity. So how do you stay ahead uh, of those forces and how do you get new ideas? And there were a number of places you could look uh, for these ideas. Uh, many of these ideas, in fact, came from individual inventors. And up until 1942, uh, the Department of Labor maintained job classifications with a job title for inventor. And uh, I gather because that became a less popular job title, it was dropped uh, subsequent to that period of time. But up until that time, that was itself a one of the things that was a check mark uh, in their job classifications. And of course, these uh, inventors had lots of imitators. So uh, there was a strong uh, primary impulse for invention, and then a lot of uh, quick copying that helped diffuse and disseminate these uh, inventions. And then there were a few companies that had very large established R&D research networks. Uh, and these actually grew initially out of the 19th century, and most economists uh, note that the German chemicals industry was really where this began. And in the mid-19th century, the chemicals companies were synthesizing new dye stuffs that could create colors that did not exist in nature. And so this was a wonderful competitive advantage because you could do things that were, did not exist naturally. So it was very hard for others to copy you unless they also understood the properties of chemistry that allowed the synthesis to take place. 
So not surprisingly, uh, this organizational form of these R&D networks uh, begins to diffuse. Initially across the German chemical companies, uh, later on firms like DuPont, which bring the model over to the United States, uh, Alfred Sloan out of the DuPont family goes to GM in the early 20th century, and before too long GM's got a network of R&D laboratories as well. Uh, and then there are parallel efforts with people like Edison uh, that give rise to the General Electric laboratory system. Uh, IBM also creates a very extensive uh, R&D system uh, in the mid-20th century. Of course, Bell Labs may be the best example uh, of these deep R&D networks uh, growing out of the communications area. And I think uh, the folks out of Bell Labs have something like 12 Nobel Prizes uh, for their R&D achievements. So this was not simply uh, testing and measuring and verification. This was deep uh, industrial research going on. And the, the management model of that period of time was explained by a former president of Harvard University, James Conant, who said, uh, the key to success is to find a man, yes, in those days he said man, find a man of genius, give him money, and then leave him alone. Uh, and this is sort of the inventor as hero uh, kind of model, very consistent with the focus on individual inventors. And this gives rise to a description of what I call this closed innovation system, which I'm showing you here as a product development funnel turned on its side. And the way to understand this model is that ideas and projects originate in a company's science and technology base, say perhaps in one of those deep R&D network uh, systems. And each of these squares you can think of as an R&D project. And in the beginning of this model, we consider a wide range of possible projects. Uh, and then as we do more research and more development, we begin to test and evaluate these projects. Uh, some of them uh, succeed, many others aren't doing so well, so we begin to narrow down the focus. And a much smaller number of projects are actually taken through to the marketplace. Uh, and you'll notice I call this a closed innovation system. And the reason I call it a closed system is that in this model, there's one way into the R&D process and there's one way out to the marketplace. So keep that property in mind, one way in, one way out. Now, let's roll forward in time and do the same exercise of looking for great ideas today. Uh, yes, we still have individual inventors, and in fact, we've built on that. Uh, a lot of users uh, of technologies themselves often innovate uh, as part of the diffusion and adoption process. So that continues to be the case today. Uh, unlike that period of time, there are lots of small companies, startups that themselves play uh, very important roles as engines of innovation, uh, particularly uh, in the diffusion of, in of inventions out into the society. Uh, one of the things you didn't see on that old slide uh, were the universities and the research institutes. A uh, hundred years ago, the universities were primarily giving degrees in divinity, the classics, uh, Greek, Roman languages, uh, history, and the like. Uh, and these were classic liberal arts degrees. And a gentleman of higher learning uh, did not condescend to study engineering and such. And indeed, it was that attitude in schools like the Ivy League that gave a, a real chance for schools like MIT and Caltech to really kind of hit the ground running. And also some of the land-grant universities I'm going to say more about later on, uh, where these folks really did seize on technology and engineering as subjects of university study uh, much faster uh, than the Ivy League caught on. Uh, today, it's very well accepted that uh, university research and technology can and often is highly useful uh, and is actually now an interesting source of ideas for lots and lots of companies. And some of those startups uh, that I was talking about before are now coming directly out of universities uh, and getting funding and getting going. Uh, of course, large companies remain an important part of the system uh, and also, there's a new set of players around the nonprofits and foundations as well. Uh, and there are a number of examples of this. Uh, in the open source uh, software movement, for example, uh, most of the code base is actually held by nonprofit organizations that manage the IP uh, in the open commons. Uh, in the life sciences, you have folks like the Gates Foundation uh, funding research and development for vaccines or malarial uh, interventions, things that are not attractive to the for-profit pharmaceutical industry, but meet uh, real social needs. Uh, and there's significant money uh, in these areas now to really promote and diffuse useful ideas and technologies. 
And so if you aggregate across all these things, they could get a very different mental model about how to think about innovation. And Bill Joy, a Berkeley grad, who is also a founder of Sun Microsystems, has a wonderful expression that I think captures this uh, in a nutshell. And his expression is, not all the smart people work for you. So if you're a company looking for ideas to grow, et cetera, your initial assumption, unlike 50 or 100 years ago, where maybe you did have to really invest to create the ideas because you couldn't necessarily count on there being much in the surrounding environment, these days there are lots of smart people in lots of places. And that should be the starting point for thinking about your innovation search for new ideas and technologies. Now, you're still going to need smart people. Uh, in this world, but part of the job for your smart people in this world is to identify, recognize, and then connect to uh, the other smart people that are out there. And so one of the points uh, that open innovation as a perspective starts with is this open and distributed model of innovation. Uh, that instead of thinking of things in a very deep hierarchy, in a sense that Alfred Chandler might argue for, say, the book he wrote about scale and scope, talking about companies like DuPont and General Motors, we're instead in much more of a network model. Uh, and in particular, a network model where there's not a necessarily a central hub, but a distributed network, where much of the activity is going on at, at the periphery uh, of the network. So uh, here are some data from the National Science Foundation on, on R&D activity. Come on in. Uh, and these data are done through uh, field surveys of R&D spending at the establishment level. Uh, and because they're done with a field survey, there's always a lag uh, in when they're reported. So the most recent data that have been reported are in 2005. And I'm showing you R&D spending in these data by the size of the company uh, doing the spending over there on the left. And then I've taken selected years uh, out of the survey results to discuss with you some of the shifts here. So in 1981, uh, the large companies of more than 25,000 employees accounted for more than 70% of the R&D spending activity in that year. In that same year, the small companies of 1,000 employees or less, all added together, accounted for less than 5% of R&D spending activity. So as recently as 1981, if you were looking for the cutting edge technology activities in many industries, most of the work was being done in yours or other very large companies. And there really wasn't that much that was that interesting going on in the very small companies in this period of time. Now look forward to 2005. The large companies still matter. There's still a plurality of R&D spending. But together, they're just over 37% of all the spending being done in R&D in that year. And those small companies of less than 1,000 employees now account for 24% of the R&D spending. Or another way to look at this is if you look at absolute dollars, the growth in R&D spending from 1981 to 2005 is overwhelmingly in the small companies. And the large companies have essentially uh, kept their spending in constant dollars about the same. And all the growth in constant dollars in R&D spending is coming from the smaller companies. And although it doesn't prove it, it suggests it's at least consistent with the story of a more distributed, more networked approach I was describing to you a moment ago. Yeah. Right. Right. So these are dollars spent uh, collected at the establishment level by the National Science Foundation. Yes, in the back. Well, uh, you notice I'm reporting R and D together. Uh, so one of the things that scholars would love to see is to separate research spending from development spending. Uh, that proves to be difficult in part because the government provides an R&D tax credit. And so that provides a, uh, I won't say it's a standard, but it certainly provides a strong motivation for companies to report that because they also get uh, a credit for doing so on their taxes. But there's no uh, incentive for separating research from development. And as a practical matter, the data aren't reported in any uh, helpful way. Now, what you'll sometimes hear as a rule of thumb is that research is perhaps 10% of the total of R&D spending. But that's sort of unsatisfying because that's going to vary by industry. So there's not good data on separating those out. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, if, well, the data, unfortunately, don't uh, survey sales by establishment, which is what you'd want. Uh, so you'd like to know sort of R&D is a percentage of sales for small, medium, and large companies. The, the, unfortunately, the data aren't reported that way. So I, I don't have a good answer for you. Okay, I'm not sure why there's a delay, but there, in any case, so this is a, our, the product development funnel again, but you'll, there's some differences now in this funnel uh, that I think are trying to capture uh, some of these trends I was describing to you. Uh, now you'll notice we still have projects that start from a science and technology base and then go through to the market. So that part of the model remains as before, but there's some differences now uh, in this characterization. One difference is ideas can come not just from the internal technology base, but can also come from an external technology base as well. And not just at the beginning of the project, but also at later stages as you get closer to the marketplace. So there are lots of ways for ideas to come into the company at different stages of development. So that's a difference. Uh, and the other difference is many of the things that companies start working on but don't make it through to the market now have other pathways that they can go through to get to the market through external licensing, spin-offs, divestitures, and so on. And so I call this model an open innovation model in contrast to the closed model I told you about a few minutes ago. And the reason I call this an open model is now there are many ways into a company's R&D process, and there are many ways for these ideas to go out to the marketplace. So you recall before I said there was only one way in, only one way out. Now we've got many ways in, many ways out. To give you a little more information on that, uh, I'll share with you a, a characterization that was done by a company in Sweden uh, that actually heard this, uh, a ver variation of this, uh, and then kind of reformulated it uh, visually themselves in a somewhat different way that I think also builds some intuition. Uh, so this is a company in Sweden called SCA. Uh, and they said, well, gee, in the closed innovation world, you aim your funnel at your current market. And you tend not to pay too much attention to what other firms uh, and their markets are up to. And in open innovation, the first thing you do is drill holes in the funnel so that ideas and technologies can flow in and out throughout the process. So instead of a rigid barrier, think of that as the boundary of the firm, if you will. Instead of the firm being a rigid barrier, that only works with internal ideas and, and essentially shuns external ideas, now we're letting these ideas filter into the company. And so what was this rigid barrier becomes more of a semi-permeable membrane in this representation. And with these holes, you can now explore different pathways for ideas to go to the market. So one pathway is the traditional pathway of internal technologies going through to market like they did before. Nothing wrong with this, perfectly valid way to go, but now a single path in a more general model. You can also have internal technologies go out to others for other markets. You can have external ideas come in, combine them with perhaps internal ideas and address a new market. You can also have external ideas supporting or adding or filling gaps in your current marketplace. And then the last pathway is conceptually the most fun, and I call it the boomerang where a project starts inside, gets to a certain level of development inside, and it's decided, you know, this really isn't going to meet our needs as a company, and so it's allowed to go to the outside and, and try its luck on the outside. Once outside, this venture has to compete for capital, customers, and employees, and there's a lot of pressure to adapt to the external environment to survive and maybe thrive that wasn't necessarily there on the inside. And in the process, sometimes these projects might discover some new latent opportunity that wasn't available or clear before. And in that case, the firm might bring it back in again. So you'll sometimes hear these called spin-ins as, as opposed to spin-outs. So all these are pathways. Rob? Uh, well, one would be a project at Cisco called Andiamo, if you're familiar with them. OK, you're not. Um, another one also from the telecom space uh, that I've actually written up, I haven't studied Andiamo, but uh, I have studied one from Lucent, uh, a project that became known as uh, Ella Media. Uh, and it was a project that started in Bell Labs, uh, 
uh, was essentially stopped internally and allowed to go to the outside and was actually given external venture capital to pursue uh, its fate on the outside. And then it turned out to have some strategic value to Lucent because of digital video and the applications of digital video. And so Lucent essentially reacquired the shares that it didn't own later on. Um, so you might think, gee, this is a terrible mistake. Those idiots should have figured this out at the beginning. But I think that misunderstands what's going on in innovation because there's so much uncertainty and so much that's not known both about the market and the technology. Uh, and so I think of this as instead sort of a second chance or a, a sort of a second opinion later on when more things are now clear uh, to look at this. So uh, the closed innovation model has no way to deal with such things. Uh, but this is something that I think is uh, why it's sort of conceptually fun. Um, well, I certainly agree with the second half of what you said. The point about not understanding it, let me just give you the data first, and then I'll, I'm a little out of sequence there, but you'll see where I'm headed. Uh, in 1976, uh, state and federal funding uh, uh, comprised about 74% of Berkeley's funding. And then tuition and private sources made up the, the remaining 26%. In 2006, 30 years later, state and federal funding had shrunk to 48%. Right, so I think the state went from about 48, maybe 52% in 76 to 30% in 2006. Uh, I was making the case that the public university has a constituency that the private university doesn't have, which is the taxpayers, in this case, of California. So let me, let me develop the argument a little bit, and you may agree with what I'm Just to remind us all where this starts from, uh, the public research university uh, emanates out of the uh, Land Grant Act, or, or the so-called Morrill Act of 1862. And that's good old Justin Morrill there a guy from Vermont, and in the act, they actually carve out uh, land from the several states. This is during the Civil War, so this was initially being carved out by the states in the North or the Union. Uh, and the, uh, the le legislation provides for colleges for the benefit of agriculture and the mechanic arts. And it's explicitly intended to both to advance technology and to broaden access of this knowledge to the working classes, both farmers and uh, working folks. So. This is what gave rise to the University of California here at Berkeley. We are a land-grant institution. We were founded in 1868 uh, out of, directly out of the resources provided out of this act. And so universities, and here I would include Stanford, are intended to explore, discover, and disseminate new knowledge. And there's an expectation in society that some of this is going to be useful. I don't, there's no expectation that all of it has to be useful, but some of it over time has to be. And then there was a big shift in World War II where the government funding for research dramatically expands uh, relative to the pre-war era. And that also uh, brings new resources to the and expectations as well. So here's federal R&D spending in constant dollars. Uh, after World War II, I start in 1955 here, uh, out through 2004. And uh, you can see that there's some major events that I identify along the way. Um, but the bulk of the funding has really been for defense. And then more recently, health is really starting uh, to take off. Now, when we get to the Energy Biosciences Institute, we're in the energy domain. And I want you to see how small the energy funding is, with one exception during the Carter years where we had that Sin Fuels initiative that you know, rose for a few years and then fell off. So uh, in general, federal funding is uh, rising quite a bit, but in the energy sector, that's not the case. Uh, energy funding 
for research has actually been quite modest uh, out of the federal government. And so, oh yeah, so here's some of the data that uh, we were talking about a few minutes ago. Um, back in 76, industry funding was just about 3% of the funding for the Berkeley campus. And in uh, 2006, 30 years later, it had risen to 12%. We don't know exactly how this is going to play out, but if you look at what's going on in the California state budget right now, it's clear that uh, higher education and the UC system in particular is going to take another whack. Much of that whack is going to come in research. And so when we see these data for the academic year, uh, the current academic year and next year, these percentages are going to be even more this way. And so this gives rise to, well, how can universities uh, partner with industry? What are some of the things that, that can be done? And one major activity that occurred in 1980 uh, was the so-called Bayh-Dole Act that allowed universities to claim ownership rights, really to file patents, on taxpayer-funded research. Prior to the Bayh-Dole Act, uh, the outputs of university research funded by the taxpayer were treated as essentially public domain knowledge and were not something you could patent. And one of the concerns in 1980 was this was during the time when the U.S. auto industry was in trouble from Japan. And the question was, what are we going to do to respond to the threat from the Japanese? Uh, the idea was let's try to harness university technology more actively and conferring property rights will help us do this and we'll get more university technology out faster. Uh, so I think that was the design of the, uh, of the legislation. Uh, and you have to say that uh, in some areas it worked very well. Uh, one, uh, I think, salient one for Berkeley was the, uh, something that was held jointly with Stanford, the Cohen-Boyer patent on recombinant DNA, which has paid out to Berkeley and Stanford more than $250 million in royalties. And the product sales emanating out of that, that use, that are based in part on that patent are more than $25 billion. So uh, clearly a lot of good stuff happened. A bad thing, well, bad is judgmental, but in my opinion, a bad thing that happened out of this is this became addictive to uh, Berkeley. And not just Berkeley, but other universities where a few universities had these kinds of big hits with a single patent that became really valuable to them. And they designed their tech transfer policies around promoting uh, these really big kind of pharma-like deals with these huge royalty streams. And all the university research uh, output uh, began to get managed out of this kind of a regime. Uh, and the universities uh, began to shift from a mode of trying to disseminate knowledge really broadly to maximizing royalties off of university inventions, which are not the same thing. I think would we all agree with that, that uh, they don't lead to quite the same direction. Do you think that blockbuster, I'm skeptical that that blockbuster focus applied to software? I think you're right to be skeptical. I think there are a lot of people who feel that Th this is, uh, it's inappropriate to apply this kind of a model to, let's say, IT research generally. But from the tech transfer people I spoke to, I don't think they had that mentality at all by the mid-90s, or probably earlier, that we did not have that kind of focus. We have somebody else with some direct experience here. What about the uh, comment that uh, is the are the IT 
parts of Berkeley being managed through models of the pharma kind of model? Is the pharma tech transfer model being applied inappropriately to the IT world? Well, I, I, I agree with you. There's a certain characterization that you can't. You'll apply to everybody who can't. It's not a good model. So that, are they or are they not being managed that way? No, I think what I'm saying is that the tech transfer offices are being not necessarily at Cal, as a, I'm going to describe Cal in just a minute, and they're actually taking a different approach. But many of the tech transfer offices at universities that are members of this group called Autumn, the Association of University Technology Managers, they benchmark how many how much royalties each university is receiving, and many of their officers are compensated on the royalties received each year out of their patent portfolio. So I'm not saying the entire university is being uh, wagged by that tail, but I am saying that there are those forces at work. Uh, and I think in some cases they are being applied to the IT side, even though I agree with your point that they really don't make sense in the IT side. Uh, so I, my point wasn't just that they didn't make sense, but that it was, it was not guiding policy. Okay, so they're not being applied. We have very flexible licensing of different software tools, you know, like bioinformatics, academic licensing, donate part to open source initiatives, fairly complicated stuff done, maybe not at Berkeley, but um, at some other top American research universities. And they were fairly urban experiments and were kind of flexible, and I don't think they were that focused. I think a lot depends on how the tech transfer office's boss is evaluated. Loyalties is simple and easy. Right. The presentations from the office here that at least I used to look at, they would try to guesstimate the number of jobs created in California, the revenues of those, and try to create numbers to make an economic development case. The metrics around preserved freedom to do research or enhance grassroots, they couldn't generate those numbers. They weren't convincing to the legislators and the constituencies that I saw these little slide decks for. It's basically, we don't know, or no one really has a clear idea how to evaluate yeah. whether a tech transfer office is doing a good job. Well, these are simple, but they're incredibly incomplete. That's the task. Yeah, good point. Uh, th those are product sales over here. Th these are the royalty payments here. Royalties here. The sales of products based on those royalties are over here. The university is not selling the products. Uh, they're only receiving the royalties. Boy, there's really a nasty delay on this. All right, so one of the thoughts to think about is, well, how do you balance the needs of industry on the one hand, the needs of universities as an open institution on the other hand? And so uh, I'm borrowing a little bit from Carol Mamura's presentation. For those of you who know Carol, she's the uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor for uh, Industry Relations and Intellectual Property. Uh, and so you can think of a continuum of open to restricted. Uh, and as you move from left to right, the overhead charges to the university typically go up, and the IP rights to the funder typically increase as well. Um, and so there's a whole range of ways to interact with universities and to fund university activity. Uh, and some of them, of course, confer no IP rights to the funder whatsoever, uh, and it also impose no delay or restraint on publication. Uh, and then as you move forward to the right-hand side, uh, you have you get university takes more overhead. There are more IP rights granted to the funding source. And so you can think of this as a continuum uh, of managing university industry uh, interactions. And then the question is, well, does it scale? And particularly, what happens when you put a lot of money uh, into a university industry collaboration? Um, and this was, I think, makes Ener the Energy Biosciences Institute an interesting one to study because uh, you'll see that there's $500 million involved in this. So this is, even for a campus like Berkeley, this is a sizable amount of money. Uh, and it generated some controversy. I don't want to overstate that, but there was some. Uh, and I think out of this creation has been both some institutional innovation by Berkeley 
and some innovation by BP as well. And so this tension that I've been setting up between universities and industry, I think are getting managed in some very interesting and creative ways uh, on both sides. And I hope to... So let's first look at the industry perspective. Uh, what was BP looking at in 2006? Uh, one of the things they were looking at was that fossil fuels were exhaustible uh, and, and weren't renewable. Uh, and so they realized that they, in their long-term planning, they needed to diversify fuel sources and identified biofuels as a potential very attractive future fuel source for them. That was in their own internal strategic planning. Out of that understanding came a realization that, well, we need to make a big push on biofuels. Uh, at the time they made this decision, they had three biologists in the company of 100,000 people. So they had a huge gap in terms of their strategic objective and the resources they had internally in terms of knowledge resources to go after the objective. And this gave rise to this request for proposal that became the basis for the Energy Biosciences Institute. So they decided to reach out outside and they looked at doing their own corporate lab and, and just saying, let's do that. We'll just build a corporate lab and we'll staff that with lots and lots of really smart people. And they decided not to do that, at least not only that. I think they are going to hire a bunch of their own really smart people in this area, but they're not going to rely exclusively on a corporate lab. And they didn't want to work with universities through the usual kind of programs, where you give some money, some papers are written, some conferences are held, and then some results are shared later on, a fairly passive, hands-off kind of relationship. Uh, that wasn't going to help them do the strategic things that they wanted to do to move their capabilities into biofuels. And so they created this uh, RFP, essentially, and circulated it, I think, among 55 uh, prospective universities uh, to invite them to really come uh, work with BP to help invent uh, the future of biofuels and help them to learn about it uh, and eventually to help BP develop capabilities in this area and also broaden general knowledge of biofuels. So their criteria for the RFP were that the research had to be broad. They weren't looking for t targeted, narrow things. They wanted a very broad scope addressed. They didn't want a single discipline driving it. They wanted it to be explicitly multidisciplinary and that there has to be an overall mission focus to what's going on. So it wasn't just research for researchers' sake. It was research in the service of the strategic objective of getting very good at biofuels down the road. So they made some choices, uh, one of which was to dangle a $500 million carrot out there for these, comp these universities that they sent this RFP to. And they eventually had five finalists that proposed uh, detailed plans of what they would do with that kind of funding. Um, they wanted to pick uh, a really world-class institution. And they interestingly wanted to think about both open work and proprietary work. So uh, we've been talking about one or the other, but the, the design here was to do some of both. And the idea, I think, was to try to create some synergy between the two. So you needed to do very fundamental open work, um, faculty-driven, uh, published, disseminated, disclosed, taught, uh, lots of doctoral students, uh, lots of uh, dissertations and other research projects in the open domain uh, funded out of this. And to, to do some of the proprietary stuff, they wanted to create an ability to locate some of their own people right next door uh, on the campus. So the idea that one of the ways that you get an organization of 100,000 people with only three biologists to get smart fast on biofuels is you locate the people right next to some of these world-class minds that are working in this area. And so it isn't just a matter of research and publication. It's really letting the people interact uh, very close by on a day-to-day -day basis to help really stimulate that transfer. And so here's how they uh, structured it. Uh, that 50 million actually covers both the open component and the proprietary component. And uh, in rough numbers, it's about 70-30. And I don't think this is... Uh, 
uh, in hard numbers, but most of the funding is for the open domain, hosted at Berkeley, working with Lawrence Berkeley Labs and the University of Illinois. Um, and then there's some portion of it uh, that's going to be managed in the proprietary uh, activities of BP itself. And then there's the uh, where the people are going to be. So uh, in the open domain, uh, there's going to be a lot of research based at the universities uh, and Lawrence Berkeley. Uh, and there the research is going to just be done on those facilities. But there's also going to be a separate commercial space rented to BP on the campus, which is a first for Berkeley, um, and have BP people doing that work. And so one of the interesting things is about the confidentiality here with the pass key to access the building, but these people are going to be out over here interacting over here. And at first, BP wanted a blanket non-disclosure agreement for everything. So every conversation you have with BP was going to be subject to non-disclosure. Uh, Berkeley pointed out that you really don't want that. That's actually not what's the best thing for you. You really want your people and our people to be talking freely and openly uh, long before we know who's got proprietary information about what. So they actually relented on that demand. And now, as I understand it, the arrangement is the discussions are open. And when there is something that BP thinks it is, it has that is confidential, and if they then want to share that with somebody in the open domain, they can then execute a specific non-disclosure for that activity, which will come much later in the process, and it's incumbent on BP to initiate that. So instead of having a blanket non-disclosure, it's much more person-to-person -person based. So is this compatible with a public university? Uh, I actually have a, maybe I've misstated my view, but I actually think this is, but I want to develop the logic a little bit with you. Uh, you can ask big questions like, does it preserve academic freedom? Does Berkeley remain open? And does society benefit from the Energy Biosciences Institute, or is it just BP? Well, to break those questions down to more specific questions, you can look at things like, who decides and assigns the research projects? Uh, who controls the IP that comes out of this stuff? And how about the dissemination? So I think if we answer these questions, we'll be able to understand the first set of questions. I think that, sh that what I just showed you shows that the way they're assigned uh, is really in a very traditional academic process of a call for papers. And really, the only unusual wrinkle is at the governance level. Uh, and there, of course, uh, the academics still have an effective veto over anything that they don't think is appropriate. So uh, on balance, there is certainly representation for BP, but it's not the case that BP can dictate the research being funded uh, out of this. So the second question is, well, how about the IP? Who owns the IP? And the arrangement there is between Berkeley as the master agreement and BP, and then Berkeley has subcontract relationships with Illinois and Lawrence Berkeley. I'm told this is perhaps true in theory, but in practice, uh, Lawrence Berkeley in particular, being a government uh, agency, uh, has its own strange IP rules. And so BP is doing a lot of stuff with Lawrence Berkeley directly. And the way they do the licensing of uh, inventions that are discovered uh, is uh, there's sort of three classes. There's the stuff that Berkeley has, or one of the universities. There's the stuff that BP has, and then there's the joint stuff that's created jointly. For the things that are owned by the universities, uh, there's a, a wide group of things that are in the non-exclusive royalty-free domain that essentially allow BP the freedom to commercialize but don't restrict Berkeley or the other universities in doing other activities with this. So they can license to other parties if they wish, uh, do other things with the IP. But from BP's standpoint, uh, BP won't have to pay a second time after funding the research in the beginning. And that was one of their big concerns. Is they don't want to have to pay initially uh, and then have to pay again <laughs> later on. Uh, then there's stuff uh, that may be uh, exclusively owned. And BP can negotiate for particular things that they think would be strategic to them. Uh, and for those, there is sort of a schedule of pre-negotiated fees. So there's some uh, 
fair amount of certainty there, but there is sort of an escape clause or a bonanza clause if there is a home run, another Cohen Boyer patent or something, then they would agree, okay, this, these rules won't apply, we'll have to negotiate in good faith separately on those. So this is the stuff for the activities. And if you look at that, this to me also seems to be pretty consistent uh, with what you think of as a public university. Uh, we've got university faculty looking for s specific funding for projects. That's very common. Uh, sponsors uh, control whether or not to fund the research at the governance level, but again, it's all or nothing. Uh, there is support for both direct costs and overhead costs, and particularly in this budget environment, that's a nice thing to have. Uh, the, the sponsor will have prior uh, viewership of research results, but do not control the dissemination of the research. Uh, university retains the ownership of the IP that the university faculty generate. Uh, BP can request that Berkeley file patents, and that's again very typical for sponsored research. Uh, and then there's the subcontracting as well. So this is actually pretty much business as usual for universities and IP with industry these days. I, I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. You mean why doesn't BP just let Berkeley decide? Or, right, they can, be, we can approve them all or they reject them all. I think it's because the, uh, the executive committee wants uh, this to be peer reviewed science and they don't want the uh, BP saying we like this, we don't like that, we like this, we don't like that. Uh, so I think that's what it is. I think it's a, an attempt to maintain uh, the a certain a objectivity and academic freedom uh, in funding the work. Um, and the hope and the, and the reason then is why does uh, BP even have a voice? Well, I think they feel that since they're providing the funding, they deserve some opportunity to at least endorse it. Or if they're really unhappy, they can make them restart the process and do another call. So it's in, I think in practice, it's not going to be very restrictive uh, on academic uh, research projects at all. We've had one round already go through, and that there was a slate of uh, 49 projects. They were approved, and those are underway now. So there are some interesting wrinkles to this. There is that proprietary component. Um, there are 10 new faculty positions at both Berkeley and Illinois that are going to flow out of this. That's a very high number to come out of a uh, sponsored research activity. And so we think back to the budget pressures from before at the state and federal level on places like Berkeley. Uh, this is very uh, important support. Uh, and you might, well, I'll, I'll talk more about that later, but um, absent something like this, uh, it would be harder for places like Berkeley to continue to work uh, in this way, to, to do this kind of work. Uh, there is a grant awarding organization, that executive committee I showed you. Um, the IP ownership has some differences, but it's actually quite consistent uh, with other things that have been done in the U.S. And the, um, and the folks in Carol Mamura's office, I think, are pretty comfortable with it. Uh, there is this non-exclusive royalty-free aspect. Uh, and the one area that gets kind of interesting is the so-called background IP. And this is intellectual property done already at Berkeley, funded by other sources uh, that may bear on what uh, BP needs to practice. And so what are the ground rules for getting access to the background IP? And the decision was made here to use that non-exclusive royalty-free treatment, except there may be cases where inventors holding background IP that are not participating in EBI might need to get some consideration in terms of some fee-bearing license in those specific instances. So background IP is in general a kind of a, a, a thorny issue for industry to sort out with universities because particularly in the IP, IT domain, so many things depend on so many other things. 
Now, there is a critique of this that comes out of uh, some of the folks on the Berkeley campus uh, that says, okay, we accept that the form of the agreement is reasonably consistent with academic freedom. But in this critique, there's a concern that the substance of how this agreement will live in practice may still uh, influence or uh, bias uh, academic freedom in the following ways. Uh, and I'm not endorsing this critique, but I want you to be aware of it because this is, was part of what some of the controversy was on campus when this was being negotiated about 18 months ago. Uh, one was that the research is going to be relevant, and I put that in quotation marks in this critique, uh, and that means the relevant research will be selected over the less relevant uh, as determined by the corporation's interest. Therefore, number two, the additional resources coming in are going to likely reinforce the relevant research, and the faculty who are behind that are going to get more resources, more stuff done, may get promoted more, uh, and move into leadership roles in the department uh, over the people who are not doing the favored research, if you will. Uh, and that over time, this will cause the faculty to become more um, corporately inclined or corporately biased. So this is essentially a critique of the haves and the have-nots, that the, the ones who are doing, let's say, cellular-based uh, biology will do well here. The people that are looking at food agricultural systems and food safety systems and so on may not do well uh, in this world. And uh, it's one thing for the university to say, uh, we think this research is deserving of funding more than that, or to have peer review do this. It's another to have it being steered by the corporation's money. So this is the critique uh, being offered. Yeah, I think. Um, so certainly on this campus, we tend to get this. There are faculty who support the research that gets better funding from other faculty. Yeah. So the haves and have nots have been with us a long time. Right, and there are still peer review items in this proposal, too. So, but, but what, what's the deal? What, what kind of complaint is specifically? Well, let, let me make your point, I think, slightly differently. What is the alternative the critics would propose? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think uh, we've already seen that the state funding is coming down and that that's putting more and more pressure on research budgets to go to industry sources to make up some of the difference. Uh, presumably, these critics are really unhappy about that. And so what the critics would propose is, at first, that the state should fully fund uh, research budgets. And uh, were that possible, that might be a great outcome. But I, I think they don't really have a feasible way in this environment of getting those extra resources. I think that would, yes, I think that um, through some peer-reviewed, more objective in their eyes uh, approach, I think that would be the alternative that they would advocate. And so one could take uh, two points of view there. One is uh, universities, particularly in the world where companies are doing less internal basic research, it's very important for societies that universities pick up the slack that that's actually socially very useful by itself. And so being relevant may actually be more important now uh, because companies are backing away. Uh, and then the more practical objective is um, we're not, it's very unlikely we're going to see that kind of research funding anytime soon. So the, the alternative of not doing things like this uh, might be to stagnate uh, and watch the faculty and the equipment go elsewhere. Uh, and does that really help Berkeley advance its mission if people doing the best work uh, no longer work at Berkeley. I think a lot of, a lot of times the alternative is something like NIH peer review 
Yes. Well, I think you've said it well. I think that would be their alternative yeah, universe. I, I, it, yeah. There is some difficulty grasping the argument. I'm not necessarily agreeing with it, but the force is ultimately about power to set the agenda. And once you set the agenda, and that agenda manages a fraction of the research faculty, time and attention, grad students, directs the um, incredibly um, important ways of thinking of formative doctoral students. Donald Stokes. Well, it's one of the quadrants, but it's not the universe. There are three other quadrants besides that one. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Right, the the Bayh-Dole Act. Right.
Yeah, I think of it as, uh, if I think about sort of what Bayh-Dole was about, it was about all this federally funded research that in the eyes of the legislation was essentially being underutilized by society. And the determination uh, in the legislation was there's a lack of property rights that is precluding this work from being utilized as much as it should be by society. So by conferring property rights, we now enable licensing and other mechanisms to transfer this technology. And for the person receiving the technology, because they have some uh, exclusivity in some domain, they can make investments to commercialize it that they wouldn't necessarily be able to make in an open domain. Uh, here, I think what we see is funding not from the taxpayer, but funding from uh, an industry source trying to add new knowledge that it doesn't currently have uh, and then trying to get ways to make this value. We haven't really talked much about the, the company view. We've talked mostly about the university view. But the company has to, for this, at this scale of investment, this isn't charity. This has to be something that pays off in some future. Even oil companies have to make money sometime, somewhere. And uh, so they're, they have to think about ways of designing a relationship with the university that's very uh, prestigious, world class, has these values of openness, and still engineer something that can work for them as well. And I'll, I'll, I think I come to that in just a few minutes. Yes. Try it again. Nope. OK. So uh, here's what's happened in the first round of projects so far. Uh, there were initially about 250 uh, inquiries about this. There was a review panel assembled, and 82 of the 250 underwent peer review. 49 of the 82 that were reviewed were selected for funding. Uh, 37 of them were in the physical and life sciences. 12 of them were in the social sciences and economics. And this website has all those uh, funded proposals uh, available uh, in abstract and who the, the principal investigator is uh, if you want to see more about that. So uh, back to our questions. Who controls the assignment of research? Who controls the IP? Who controls dissemination? Um, I've already explained the, uh, the two-step process of the, the governance. Um, who controls the IP? Well, there are basically three buckets. The your bucket, BP, uh, in the case of BP, there's the universities, there's BPs, and then there's the joint stuff. And then Berkeley basically controls the dissemination. Uh, and there is uh, uh, something of an exception where uh, BP might want to file a patent, and so in that case they might uh, delay for a short period of time to allow the patent application to proceed forward. But in general, this is pretty... Uh, pretty typical, I think. And then there's the question of academic impact. Is Berkeley better or worse off? Would other universities accept this? And how will the taxpayers view this? Because again, Berkeley being a state-supported institution, um, ultimately the taxpayers uh, have lots of ways of uh, rewarding or withholding, uh, depending on all this. I don't have uh, a lot of data on that last point, but just to share with you some perspectives, uh, as I said earlier, between Berkeley and Illinois, there will be 10 new faculty positions, and there will be dozens of graduate students uh, supported out of this. So a lot of good work, I think, will come. And that work, as you saw earlier, will be that peer-reviewed, investor-led uh, kind of work. Now, there's going to be a proprietary component that BP is going to go after. We'll talk more about in a minute. 
Would other universities accept this? Well, there were four other finalists for this, and they're places like MIT and uh, Oxford and Cambridge. So these are you know, well-respected uni universities. So my sense is, yeah, they'd accept it in a heartbeat. <laughs> Uh, now, the tougher question is about the taxpayers. Uh, if they really don't support this, they could further reduce research support through the legislature. Uh, we're actually running that experiment uh, right now, not necessarily for this reason, but that research funding is being pressured uh, quite substantially, and every indication is next academic year is going to continue to be as bad, if not worse. So uh, this is, I think, an interesting one. Um, that will take more time to play out and see how this actually is perceived. I think the good thing from the taxpayer view is this is uh, renewable green energy, which in California is a pretty popular topic. There was an earlier uh, project at a much smaller scale with Novartis around genetically modified organisms for agriculture. That was a more controversial one because genetically modified organisms were controversial on their own. So. Uh, a lot of people in the state of California weren't as wild about that. Here, I think there's more genuine enthusiasm for this green energy kind of stuff. And then we all look at it from BP's side. Um, now, you made the point earlier that maybe, th maybe this could be beneficial from a reputation and public relations point of view, um, and it's difficult to refute that. Um, but I've talked to the people at BP running it, and they clearly report themselves as being under pressure to make sure this actually is beneficial to BP. So they're not simply managing it uh, in a very hands-off way, which is what you would do if it was simply a donation or charity. Uh, they are investing a lot of time and resources here on campus uh, to try to interact with the work being done so that it does turn into something of value for them. So what are they getting for their 500 million? Well, I think they're getting at least a couple of things. Of course, they're getting access to world-class bioscience, but I think from BP's standpoint, what really they're getting is speed. They're getting access to this faster than they would get if they tried to do this on their own. It would be very hard to recruit those early uh, bioscientists uh, into BP, particularly really good bioscientists. They probably get access to much better people much faster through this mechanism than they would on their own. Now, how much will they learn? Well, they're going to have to invest additional resources to get this learning. Not only the stuff they're doing here on campus, they've got to build receiving organizations uh, back in their businesses. So they're going to have to have a biofuels business starting up in BP. They're going to have to have a, a place to go find land to grow the crops that are being identified in this research as being a feedstock for the biofuels. They're going to need to develop the capability of not only using the, the enzymes to break down the cellulose and create the energy, but then to put that into manufacturing, and for the oil industry, really high volume manufacturing. So this is, these are considerable investments that are going to have to be made by BP to get real value out of this. Um, and that's also related to the transfer. They're going to have to invest a lot, wholly apart from the investment here at Berkeley, to really make this pay off. So this is, from their standpoint, is really the tip of the iceberg. It's not by any means the total commitment. They have to invest a lot. So my last slide, could this in fact, I, I posed this to you as tension between industry on the one hand and university on the other. And I think our discussion has identified some of these tensions, including some I didn't mention. So thank you for those. Um, but I think it's also interesting to think about, could this be a model for industries uh, and universities going forward? Because I think it does respect the essential logic of the public research university. And it's a little early to say, but a, a year in, BP so far seems to be satisfied with what it's getting, although it's too early for them to really know. Um, so let's, uh, let's stipulate that BP continues to feel that they're getting something valuable out of this, in which case maybe there is something to be learned, not only for this, but for potentially other collaborations going forward.
That's right. But nevertheless, it's the same issue. Sure. It could be the next one behind it. And Amherst, for for the rest of us, tell us about Amherst because it's some Berkeley faculty that are spinning out a new startup company, uh, building off of some of this knowledge that we're describing. Uh, well, so two thoughts about that, and I suspect we're going to have a more general conversation. Uh, one thought is when they were being uh, presenting as one of the five finalists, the node Kosla from uh, the venture capital community came to, as part of the Berkeley group to BP and said, uh, if you want, want to talk about green energy startups and spinoffs, uh, Silicon Valley is ground zero where most of that's going on. And uh, he was very encouraged and thought there would be lots of spin-offs out of this kind of research activity. Uh, and that, from BP's standpoint, was a positive weighing in Berkeley's favor because BP doesn't necessarily want to have to do the entire value chain on their own. Uh, they might actually like a world where there might be multiple small companies exploring multiple different feedstocks, pathways, uh, and so on. As long as those roads lead back to BP at some point, they might actually like that world. So uh, they actually saw that apparently as a positive in their evaluating of these activities. Uh, the second one is that if you uh, mandate open parts from the outset as the university, um, you will, I think, eliminate the, the spin-offs, uh, except for the ones that are finding another way to, to skin the cat, a different kind of business model. And that could happen. Uh, but you're right that I think in this context, I'm not aware of any discussion where that judgment was uh, made. I think there was a lot of discussion about academic freedom. Uh, there wasn't much discussion that I'm aware of about what you're raising there. And also from the uh, Finnish technology funding agency, Tekis, too. So, uh, so those of you looking for research funding, don't let him leave the room. Yeah. 
Oh, no, no, it's uh, happily Berkeley's research budget's much, much bigger across the whole campus uh, than $50 million. No, 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 five hundred. Yeah, that, well, you have to look at it, $50 million a year. Yes. Uh, and in fact, as you saw, it's actually only $35 million a year to the public side. Fifteen of that's going to be P. So the Yes, that's right. It's a few percent. Now, the other thing is, what is this in BP spending? turns out BP spends something like three or four billion dollars a year on R&D. So this is a big deal, but 50 million a year for BP in a budget of uh, three to four billion, a little over one percent. It's, it's not uh, make or break for the whole company. That's a very good point. In fact, one of the things that they've said to me is that it may be that, depending on the feedstock, that biofuels simply aren't going to work socially because they take up too much land and they drive up food prices too high that society won't sustain it. It'll, it'll be too controversial. And they would rather know that now, uh, before they've made big investments in their own money in building up you know, plants and distribution networks, they would like to know that if they're willing to have it fail, uh, and they'd like it to fail early if it's going to fail. So they, they would like that knowledge uh, sooner rather than later. Well, there's a couple of aspects. Uh, there are other relationships already in place at Berkeley. And I'm told secondhand that those relationships continue just as before. And if anything, people are even more excited because there's more activity on the campus. Uh, we're also able to bring people like Chris Somerville, who was at Stanford, came over to head the EBI. So he's, he's actually a nice uh, new appointment on the faculty. That, and the people around him that he will bring in uh, are really uh, viewed as very positive as well. What I don't know is pr for new uh, relationships or new initiatives that are, are large initiatives, will this uh, block or uh, interfere with those? I don't know that. Uh, and that is a risk for a university taking one of these on, is if you get too close to one company, you may be making yourself very distant from other companies. Yes? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think in this case, what is clearly intended is basic research. Um, you and I have talked about science parks in Spain. Uh, by contrast, in Spanish science parks, uh, that is focused on what they call translational research. So this is much further along where they're taking research discoveries already that have been done at the university and trying to develop them a little further so they become more attractive to industry. Industry has the perception that these aren't ready for prime time yet, and they need some further development before they really become useful by industry. So that's at a further downstream stage of activity. Here, I think it really is more basic research oriented. Uh, well, this framework uh, has, is, I think, fairly, this only was agreed a year ago. So this is fairly new. Um, so uh, your question is, what, what are other companies other doing with Berkeley? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, I think in the small companies, you have to look at two different types. One type of small company are the startups that spin out of the university, often with a principal investigator, a faculty member, is one of the founders. Those people have all the inside information on the technology, where it is, where it is in the patenting process, uh, how close it is to commercialization, and all this stuff. 
those people probably do very well in this kind of an environment. Yeah. The second kind of small company are the folks that don't have anybody on the inside. Yeah. They, I think, are disadvantaged in this system because the large companies have their own equivalents to the tech transfer office. They have university relations people and they are in fairly constant dialogue about what's new, what new research is coming, and they're in a position when they see things that are attractive to begin discussions and negotiations. Right. Small companies typically don't have the resources to track that. Okay. So unless they have some personal relationship that allows them to know about a new discovery that's, being, uh, that's been disclosed and is now available for license, they often don't hear about the opportunities until much later. Yeah, but just an example, uh, middle-sized companies, maybe kind of, I'll call it the pro producers, they mm -hmm. may have some interest in that, this kind of uh, serious business yeah. ideas. So that they may come, want to come into this uh, circle and some, uh, some, some uh, join the effort. Yes, I agree. Well, this particular project is just BP, yeah. Berkeley, and Illinois. Okay. They're, they're not accepting other members to this project. It's only BP and these guys. So this is not a consortium model. Right. There are other research initiatives that are a consortium. Uh, and then the question is, who's allowed to join, and uh, what, do the jo what do the people joining the consortium get in the way of rights and access? Um, the other thing I was going to say for the smaller and medium-sized companies is that as the universities become more important for the basic research of the innovation system, small and medium companies would do well to pay more attention to creating scientific advisory boards for those, each of those companies and actually having three or five academics that meet a couple, three times a year uh, in the areas that these companies care about because those people can become gateways into the academic world and help you spot the opportunities. And it doesn't cost a lot of money to create these advisory boards, and they become entry points into the network. Small and medium companies that ex don't, don't have a scientific advisory board or don't have any university faculty on their science advisory board, I think, are losing uh, access to what could be an increasingly valuable source of uh, ideas and technology. Well, we're past time. Thank you very much for coming and your excellent questions. Uh, we, will, we will post this on the uh, open innovation at berkeley.edu website, uh, so if you want copies of it.